This morning, I have the privilege of talking about family, and uh, as we, I do so, I think it would be uh, remiss of me. There's a big word for you. I looked it up to make sure that, that that does fit. It sounded right, and I looked it up in the dictionary, and I wrote it in my notes, remiss. Now, I can't remember what it is, but it would be something of me, like I wouldn't be holding up my, yeah, I don't know what it, you look it up yourself. It works. It does fit. Um, but to show a picture of my family, and so uh, I thought, you know, 19 years ago this week, we uh, were here interviewing, and I thought it might be interesting to see what we look like 19 years ago, and so here's a picture of our family uh, 19 years ago. This was us. Uh, when we came to New Hope, this was just a, a few months before uh, we moved here, and uh, that little guy uh, was three years old in this picture. He just turned four right before we, uh, our first Sunday was in October, the end of October, and Zach turned four October the 6th. So he's got a birthday coming up, uh, and he'll be 23. So you do the math, it all works out, right? But uh, so over 19 years, uh, this, is, this is how we've ended up. This is a picture from last summer when that little guy uh, got married. And so there's a picture of our family, uh, cur- most current picture for those of you that don't know who my family is. This is Brianna uh, on the left, and Brianna will turn 16 on Thursday. She's excited about getting her driver's license. And then Ethan is 12, and then Zach, of course, the guy, now he has a big ponytail on top of his head. You saw him up here praying today. And his wife, Marin, who is leading the choir, and my wife, Jeannie, who's sitting here on the front row. And then, of course, me, I'm wearing the same suit that I wore that day. And then, uh, <laughs> and then Elijah, who is 13, will soon turn 14, and Mackenzie, who is 18, on the end. So that's exciting because six, all six of my kids were up here in the choir today, and uh, that's very, very uh, rewarding for me as a dad to see them all up here. And um, so since I... Since I have a microphone, I, I just thought I'd brag a little bit and let you in on uh, our life a little bit. And uh, so let's get into the message today as we talk about family. Uh, family is a design of God. God is the one who created uh, the family. It's his idea. It's his plan. Family is probably the most basic building block of human society. Pope John Paul II uh, was stated as saying this, as the family goes, so goes the nation. And for that matter, so goes the world that we live in. So the family really kind of defines the success of our culture, and if you keep up with news or just informed of what's going on, you know that the family and values and all in our culture is really uh, being attacked. And uh, I think it's important and appropriate for us to look at the family, to talk about it, to understand as, as uh, people created by God who have the, the instruction book, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to stand up and what do we do in a society that we live in like this? And so we're going to be looking into the various family relationships, touching on that just a little bit, and uh, hopefully it'll be something that you uh, can latch hold of and uh, really listen to the Lord and what he'd have you to do. So I want us to go all the way back to the beginning as we look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Several verses throughout scripture that talk about God creating And uh, um, we know that in that first chapter of Genesis, there were six days that God created and a seventh day where he rested. And in each of those six days, he created different things. But at the end of each day, it says that God looked at all that he had made that day and his reaction every day was, it is good. On the sixth day, he created all the animals that uh, roam on the ground And he also created humans. He created Adam. And uh, interesting note on that day, day number six, the last day that he created before he rested, he stepped back, looked at what he had created, and unlike the other days where he said, it is good, it is good, it's good, it's good, it's good, on the sixth day he said, it is very good. So there was something unique about his creation of man, and what we read about the the uniqueness of that creation is that man was created in God's image. 
very different from all the other creation that he had made. We were made in God's image. We were patterned after him. We have a relational nature because God himself is relational. We were created for him. God walked with Adam and Eve and, and had communication and, and fellowship together with them. And uh, we read on in Genesis, get into chapter 2 after his creation, and it's recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, that God said, it's not good. He looked at Adam and he said, it's not good that, that he is alone. He needed a helper. I don't know if you've ever thought about this about Adam, uh, but Adam being created the first man of, uh, created by God, he didn't have parents. You ever stop and think about that? He didn't have siblings, um, no parents. Uh, he kind of learned to be human all on his own, no family. And God looked at it and said it wasn't good for him to be alone. So scripture says that he caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep and he took a rib from his side and out of that rib, he made a woman. Notice that he didn't take a, a, a bone out of his head, didn't take one out of his foot for him to dominate over her, out of his side to be, to be a partner, to be a helper. And I think it's significant. But it says that they were united together and they became one flesh. And God commanded them to be fruitful, to multiply, to increase in number. And through this union uh, with their children, they became a family. Like I said, the most essential building block of human society. And so God's plan all along in all of this is about relationships because God is a relational God. Uh, him interacting with his creation, our interactions in our relationship with him and with one another, uh, it's got this idea of relationships. Uh, of all God's creation, Adam and Eve, they were placed above all that. He gave them authority and dominion. Uh, but there's the, the uniqueness of being created in God's image uh, and it being a relational thing. It comes out in the fact that we know one another and we are known by one another through relational um, titles. For instance, you are the son and daughter of someone. I'm the son of Jerry and Sandy. And some of you know them, most of you don't. But uh, for people that do, that means something. There's people that know them that don't know me. They meet me and they say, oh, you're Jerry and Sandy's son. Or they may know you as a brother or a sister to so-and-so. Or the, the, the father or mother or whatever it might be. So we have these titles of, of husband, of wife, of mother, father, son, daughter, friend, neighbor, pastor, whatever it might be, and all those titles that we, that we hold uh, symbolize relationship. It's, I'm connected to so-and-so, and that's how you can know me, because I'm, I'm, I'm with them. I'm with, I'm with Jeannie. I'm her husband, and uh, I, like, I like hanging out with her. Uh, some of you know her better than you know me, and you put up with me because you like her, but that's how relationships go. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're talking about this whole idea of family uh, out of a relationship. I want to look at Romans chapter 12, if you want to turn there. Uh, and this passage of Scripture is one I really like. It, it, it applies to every relationship that you have. And there's a lot of good Scriptures, there's a lot of Scriptures that we could use, but this one particular passage in Romans chapter 12 I like. I think it applies. It's really, uh, it, it's a lot, but it gives us some very specific uh, ways that we can implement relationship uh, in our lives. How do we interact with one another? And he gives us the, really a, an instruction book, a rule book, uh, a guideline of how those relationships should go in order for them to be the best that they can be and for us to be able to uh, be who God created us to be in relationship with one another. And if we would really employ these things, our world would be a very, very different place. Let's read in, in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. He says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. I'm reading the New Living Translation, and I realize that that's in NIV. But if you can listen what I'm saying, and, and that, that should, they should match up. Don't just pretend to love each other. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. 
Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. There's a lot of directive there of how our relationships ought to go. And I think this is something that if there was ever a scripture that you could put to memory and, and by putting it to memory, letting it become part of your life, that you would actually begin to live these things out in your relationship uh, with your husband or with your wife, uh, with your parents or with your children, uh, neighbors, your uh, family here at church, wherever it might be. If this particular scripture, which is, compa- I mean, it, it's influenced by the fact that we are first loved by Christ. And the only way that we can love is because he first loved us. And so we take this scripture, we, we, we put the words in our mind and in our heart, we put it to memory, and hopefully we begin to process and live that out. And I'm telling you, our world would be a, a, a totally different place. Our marriages would, would, would not struggle near as much if, if each partner in the relationship would make it their goal to honor the other one. And in the English Standard Version, I love it, where it says in verse 10, it says, outdo one another in showing honor, which means that you would make your whole purpose to outdo your spouse in holding them up and showing honor. And so if they do that for you, you're saying, going to one-up you on that. And it's all about serving one another. And I promise you, in all of our relationships, whether it's marriage, it's family relationships, if we would honor one another, uh, we have counselors that, that, that are here, part of this church, but, it would, it would, but their jobs would begin to decrease if we were to live like that with one another. And I think it would be fantastic, uh, uh, and what a, what a witness and a representation of Christ's love in our life. So I want to look at some, some of those relationships uh, in the family, and I know not everyone here is married. We're going to talk about marriage. I know not everyone here has children. Maybe you have children that are grown. You've got grandchildren. But all of our relationships, there's principles in everything here that we can apply to our life. And this is just kind of me talking. We're looking at Scripture, but it's kind of me talking. I, I uh, have some experience in life. It's not like I'm old like Pastor Weaver. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> but but I but I you know I'm I'm not going to tell you how old I am but I will have a birthday next year that ends in a zero. Yeah, what do they call that? Fifty. That's what they call it. <laughs> well, next year celebrate my 28 uh, anniversary being married to Jeannie, uh, her putting up with me, uh, but. But marriage, let's look at that just for, for a moment. Um, marriage, I believe, is the foundation of all of our human uh, relationships. It's where God started. He created Adam, and he created Eve for Adam. So we've got this, this interaction between a husband and a wife. And the Bible has a lot to say about what makes marriages work. Some of those words uh, would be love and honor, respect, submit, serve, sacrifice. So we get this picture, this idea that marriage calls us to an entirely new and an entirely selfless life. It's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week commitment. And, uh, and there, there is a huge commitment in, in marriage. I believe that marriage is not so much about finding the right mate as it is about being, about being the right mate. Probably most of us here who are married would admit to some degree that when you chose the person that you wanted to spend the rest of your life with, uh, at least to some degree, it was for selfish reasons, for what you gained from that relationship. For instance, you you saw that person and you thought, wow, you know, I, I love the way I feel when I'm with them. I love the way they treat me. I love the things that they do for me. It's a, it's, it's a selfish kind of a thing. I don't think that uh, it, we're human. 
yeah, we've got that nature, we look at that, but I want to challenge us this morning that uh, our, our marriage relationship should be more not what I get out of it, but what I bring to it. What do I have to offer? What can I give that would make my wife a better, a better wife? What can, I, what can I give to her that would help her be more effective as a mom? What can I do to help her be more effective in her relationships with other people? And I think if, if we took this goal of loving and honoring and outdoing each other in that, then what my interaction with her shouldn't beat her down, it should build her up. And I think that's the, the beauty of thinking of it from a different angle of not what do I get out of it, because what happens is a lot of times we get married uh, for happiness, because we fell in love and we're happy. The only problem with that is uh, when love is described like that and love is a feeling, it's easy to fall out of love. There's days, and you all know, those of you that have been married, there's days where you don't feel love toward the other person. There's not those feelings that you felt in the beginning. And that's okay because love isn't about feelings. Love is a decision. Love is a choice. And I am of the opinion that we can choose to love anyone that we want to. God didn't call us just to love the people who are lovely, love the people who are naturally attracted to you. We're to love everyone. And so in your marriage, you, you love. It's a choice. And I, it, it, happiness, you know, we could say, well, we just, I'm just not real happy in this like I was. And so that's the reason to, to uh, possibly get out of the marriage. But I believe when we, when we uh, enter it by saying, what can I give, and expecting that it's not what I get out of it, but what I can give to it, it would radically change our marriage relationships. So in other words, not, not focusing on what I gain, but what I offer, what I have to offer. It's not about us. And I believe that marriage is probably the best potential for us to uh, become the most like God. Of all our human relationships, that marriage relationship gives you the most opportunity to be like Christ. There's no other human relationship that demands so much from you. And so we ought to take advantage of that and allow ourselves to face some of those character issues that we may not face any, any other place in our life. And so today I want to challenge you to be the best husband or be the best wife you can with God's help. The only way you're going to be able to do that is with God's help. And so trust in, in him. So we've got the marriage relationship. We've got a, a relationship of a parent to a child. And scripture says of that relationship, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Proverbs 22, 6 says to train a child in the way they should go. And even when they are old, they won't depart from it. Bringing our children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's really uh, simply about following the owner's manual. That's not something that we're all inclined to do. Okay? I know, guys, we get a bad rap for not using directions, but it's just part of who we are. I put together a grill many, many years ago. I bought the grill. I didn't want to pay $50 at Sam's Club to have it all put together for me. Plus, I didn't have a vehicle to carry it. I thought, I'll just buy it in the box and go save myself 50 bucks, be responsible. It took me three days. <laughs> and I finally read the instructions. <laughs> but I'm telling you, even with the instructions, it still would have taken a long time. There's so many little screws and little parts, and it's so discouraging and disheartening when you have stuff left over at the end, I still have parts in my garage of things that I put together that I, I still don't know where they're supposed to go. But it helps to follow the instructions. And as, as parents, uh, how many, I know some of you, would under, you, you understand what I'm saying is that it's not an easy job. It's a, it's a difficult uh, responsibility, but very rewarding. But uh, even after five children and 20, almost 23 years of being a parent, I'm still about as lost as I was at the beginning. I figured a couple of things out, but just the time I get it figured out, um, not all my kids are alike. And that's hard for them. I don't know if you've ever heard these kind of statements. Well, you didn't do that for them. Anybody? You ever heard that as a parent? Well, why'd you do that for them and not for me? Well, you know what? I handed out some punishment there, too. You want some of their punishment? <laughs> I, 
but it's all different. And, and so it makes it challenging as a parent to do the right thing and be the, 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 the right person at the right time. It, I've failed so many times. And uh, it, we need to do our best, though, to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I want to read for you from Deuteronomy. Uh, you'll recognize some of you this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it says this, this is Moses speaking, he says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So this training and instructing is all about, again, about relationship. If you're being trained in something, you got a new job and you're getting training there, it's usually you standing next to a person and watching them, right? Usually if you get a new job and train, training isn't, okay, you go over here and you figure that out by yourself. Usually it's come watch me for a little bit and then I'm going to put you in that and I'm going to watch you for a little bit and if we think that's okay, then we're going to let you do it for a little bit and uh, then hopefully you, you figure it out from there. That's the kind of thing that you know, parenting and, and all of this is. And so this is what Moses is saying, I'm directing to you to teach and observe uh, what God has given to me. Verse two, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. So there's benefit to all of this. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. Verse four, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. And he's saying this, this word of the Lord is something that's supposed to be so part of your life that it should be in your heart. And the reason it's in your heart and not in your head is so that when it gets to your heart, it comes out of your life. It's not just gaining information so that we can pass a test. You see, that's kind of how education works in, in our culture, at least. You know, we go to school and we get, we get information. And the teachers teach the information out of the book or wherever else it comes from, and they teach it to us, and then uh, we uh, take a, t a test whether that's verbal or written, and we go to this test time and we take all the information that we learned, we put it back down on paper, we regurgitate it back out, and then it's scored, and if we get more than 60%, then we've learned. And that's, that's the process here. That's true, right? Most of you? You're looking at me blank. That's, how we, that's what happens. We take tests and they say, you know what, you've learned the material, you move on to the next level. But the real learning begins when it, when it gets in our heart, and then it becomes who we are, and it comes out in the ways that we live, and the way that we treat one another, and our relationships. And Moses is saying here, you, you put this word, it, it needs to be part of you. And so he's saying, look, when you get up in the morning, you, you start talking about it. When you sit at the table and you're eating with your family, you, you talk about these things. When you're in the car, and you're going to school to drop kids off or wherever you're going, you talk about these things. You rehearse it. You go over it again and again and again. And, what, and, and hopefully, as you do life with your, with your family, it's not just information. Then it be, you begin to find places in life where it works itself out. And it's like you, you've, you have situations where now you're able to demonstrate and display those things in action for your children. Or you catch them doing the same kind of thing and you, and you, and you highlight that and say, look, look what you did here. But it takes relationship to do that. Relationships are key to all of this. So it's so important that we teach our kids about the Lord and, and about his commands. It's, it's important that we bring them to church regularly. Our kids need to be here. Our kids need this kind of input. There's all kinds of input that they're getting out in, around the world. We need, we need uh, to bring our kids to church. We have incredible, you saw our, our uh, children's pastors and our youth pastors in the video up here. They're doing great things. Uh, we, we have great ministries to kids and, and children. And don't just bring your kids and drop them off. You come and do life with them. 
We've got great classes for adults, and you can come and get plugged in yourself, and then you've got opportunity uh, to carry this out. So it's not just, you know, we, we go to church and we learn, and that's the end of it. Here's the deal. Our kids go to school. We bring them to Sunday school and to church, but we are the primary educators of our kids. We can't leave that to the school. They go to school six or seven hours a day, but we have them the rest of the time. That's where it all gets put into practice. And we gotta realize, you know, just getting information isn't education, that's the start of the process. And then it matters what we do with that, with that information so that it becomes part of who we are and it begins to live out through our life. And so we are the primary educators of our children as parents and grandparents. It should be, become part of our everyday life. And so what, what Moses is saying here in Deuteronomy is, is commit to wholeheartedly following the Lord's commands, not just, not just memorizing and rehearsing. That's all good. But then teach them to your children. Talk about it. Rehearse it. Um, every time you get a chance, repeat them again, go over them, rehearse them, put it into practice, apply it to your everyday life. James tells us not to be, not just to be hearers, because he said if you're just hearing only and that's it, then you're deceiving yourselves. He said do what it says. So when you hear the word, when you hear a message, when you're a part of a class, don't just walk away thinking, hey, I got, got a little, few more uh, pieces of information that I'd never heard before, and now I'm smarter, I'm more educated. But what is that going to do? How does that affect? How does that apply to your life? What are we going to do differently? How is it going to shape me and affect me? And we've got that opportunity as parents uh, to, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're giving them their education. So put God's word up wherever you can. I don't know how many people write on the, the door frames of their houses. Some of you got some nice, nice uh, woodwork or whatever. Um, maybe sticky notes, not writing it on there. But if you want to write it on there, I think that, would, that, that says commitment to write scriptures or, or the words that you want your, your children to see that you need to see. Uh, mirrors, you know, we spend a lot of time in front of the mirror as Americans. And thank you that you guys spent some time in front of the mirror today. That, that, that helps me looking at all of you. But you know that we spend a lot of time in front of a mirror, so that's a good place to, to put God's word. Uh, the refrigerator, we spend a lot of time in and out of the refrigerator in a day. It's a good place to put God's word so that we see it, that it's continually before us, and we can talk about it as a family. Listen to the word of God. In your car, um, I, I was, I was uh, chastised. Well, actually, I, I asked for it, but uh, we went to our pediatrician, and uh, Zach was just in third grade, and Went to the pediatrician because he was scared. He was, he was afraid. He uh, wouldn't let us leave a room of our house. And our, our, our main level is kind of an open floor plan. But if we would go from one room to the other, he was like on our heels. And he was afraid to go in his room, which is on the second, second level. He had this fear that someone was going to climb into his bedroom window and steal him. And I'm thinking, where in the world does that come from? And so we, we went to our pediatrician and we're asking, he's a Christian man, and we're asking him about all of this. And he, first question he asked me, he says, do you listen to the news? Like in the car? Yeah, I'm a faithful WHO person. I'm old, I listen to talk radio. And he said, that's a problem, stop doing that. Whoa. He said, you know, where, where, where would he have gotten this information? And I start thinking, putting things together. Just a couple weeks prior, there was a, a story on the news where uh, a child had been taken from their home and kidnapped. And he heard that on the radio, and with a couple other events that had happened, he put it all together that somebody's going to get me. Somebody's going to take me. And, you know, a third grader doesn't have the right kind of filter, the right kind of context, to process all that information. But if you stop and think about what's on the news and not only just what you listen to in your car, but watching the news, he said, don't, don't watch the news at five o'clock and six, six o'clock. If you have to watch the news, watch it after they go to bed. And that was great wisdom, but it, it, it got me right where I'm at because I'm realizing, okay, I've been doing this wrong all this time. But think about what kind of things come through the news, all the junk and the uh, um, the garbage, the negative, the depressing, the, the violence, the kidnappings, the terrorist activity, okay? And, and he just couldn't handle that. So we've gone to listen to music in our car, and, and my kids will tell you, we listen to music in the car. Uh, we, we've got great Christian radio options to listen to. Uh, Ethan, my youngest, he likes uh, rap. And so, you know, we listen to rap in the car. 
it's like bottom of my choices of things to listen to. Um, but I'll listen to that, you know, because there's some good Christian alternatives of things uh, wrapped as a whole, bad. The genre, I mean, it's, there's junk there. But there are Christian people. You can get on websites and find Christian artists in just about any genre of the popular music that our kids are listening to. And I'm saying it's not my favorite thing, but if, it, if that's what he likes, I'm going to get it so that he can listen to it. And uh, so that's what we, we listen to Christian music as much as we can. And, you know, you can stream stuff. Some of you got Bluetooth. You can stream it through your, through your car radio and all of that. And Spotify is a great tool for that. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot of things like that. I would say as much as you can, uh, get good things into your kids, things for them to listen to. Or find a worship song, some worship songs that we do or that they do in youth group. And they're rehearsing those. There's some, that you're filling your mind with good stuff. And that's part of our teaching. Uh, monitor what they watch on TV, the websites that they go to, it's so important. But what I want to challenge you is take seriously our role of bringing up kids and training them in the, in the instruction of the Lord. But we remember that it's all about relationships. It's in the context of relationships. You know your kids best. That's part of training them up in the way that they should go. You know their propensities. You know their, the, the, the special gifts and abilities that they have to encourage them in, in those ways and in the ways of the Lord. And so um, use, those, use those gifts. Okay, enough of that. Children, I've told you I've got a lot to say. I haven't preached in three months. So uh, Ephesians chapter 6, it says, verse 1 to 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. And so, children, here's the deal. Um, You're simply commanded to obey your parents. No exceptions. Now, we can talk about exceptions. There may be some very uh, out there exceptions, but, you know, that's what we always do. We always go to the exceptions first. But the rule is, children, obey your parents. And unless they're doing absolutely something immoral, uh, you know, that's, that's what you're commanded to do. And as parents, that's what we do in raising our children. Really, uh, we're teaching them how to obey. They don't come that way to us. They don't come all wired up to obey. How many of you found that to be truth? Okay. They actually come the opposite. I don't know how, or maybe it's just my kids. But they come opposite that, and we have to teach them and train them how to do the right things. I love my kids. I'm not, Ethan, I'm not talking bad, okay? You're a great, this guy right here has a gift for music, and it's just natural in him, and I, he wouldn't do this for me right now, but if, if, uh, if he could come up here and he'd just sit down and start playing, we'd be singing with him. He can take, take, make a piano Make beautiful sounds. We are blessed in our home to be able to hear him playing, and plus he's a percussionist too, and so um, he's got a gift, and as a parent, you know, we want to encourage those things. Um, but we've been given a responsibility over our children. Children, you need to understand that. We as parents, we have to answer to God uh, for our responsibility to you as parents in raising you. And so obeying our parents isn't optional. It's the right thing to do is what it says. It's the only one of the Ten Commandments that has a promise that it will go well with you. Obey, and it'll go well with you. And you'll live a long life on the earth. We're all about that. So obedience to your parents is really training for obedience to the Lord. And that's ultimately what we want, because that brings blessing to our life. Like I said, our families in our current culture are under attack. Now, more than ever, we need to fulfill our God-given responsibilities so that we can experience his peace and his blessing in our life. So the church is basically an extension of the family. The Bible uses a lot of metaphors to uh, describe the church, but probably the most overwhelming metaphor of the church is family. We're the family of God. We're the family of believers. Here's the deal. Everyone needs a place to belong. We're made that way. We're made relational, not to be isolated, not to be alone, but to be together and experience life together. It's a story of this little old lady who every week she waited in a line at the post office to buy two stamps. One day as she, was, she got to the counter, the postal worker who had seen her coming over the weeks, he said, you know, you don't have to wait in this line to buy stamps. 
uh, there's a machine right over here, and you can buy 20 of them at a time, and you can save yourself a trip. And she said, oh, I know that. I know that I can do that, but the machine doesn't ask about my arthritis. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just look for those moments where we get interaction with people, and we need that. We need that. We need to know that we belong somewhere, that we connect with other people. We're wired that way, belonging. Maybe you've never felt like you belong somewhere. Uh, You never knew what the blessing of being part of something big and awesome is the family of God, but it's a pretty awesome thing to be part of. And uh, one last verse that I want to read for you. I know we're running short on time, but Ecclesiastes chapter 4. A picture of how the church and the body uh, operate together. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either, either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. So what we see here is strength. Two are better than one. Two get more work done than one. I, I, I found that to be true on my sabbatical. I worked on it, the deck on my house. And uh, there was a couple of days where my dad came down and helped me. It was amazing how much I got done when I had the help of my dad there. He knows more than I do, but just two, two people. Uh, when I'm by myself, you know, I'm cutting a board, and I, uh, it's so long, I, I have to, like, go over here and, and tack it up or whatever, and I get over here, and I realize, okay, that's not right. So then i got to take that down, take this down, take it back to the saw, back and forth. It, it just... Two people can get work done a lot better than one. It almost more than doubles. You know what I'm talking about. There's strength in numbers. Listen to this. No one can do alone what all of us can do together. No one can do alone what all of us can do together. And none of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. And that it really is a picture of our church. Our church is not like a lot of others, but I'd say looking out here, there's probably 90, 95% of people that come and belong to this church have a place where they, where they serve. And that's amazing. It really is amazing. And it talks about your heart and your love for one another and, and serving and ministering to one another. There's strength in numbers. And there's support. Um, you know, he, he says, Solomon says, if, if one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the man who falls and no one's there to help him up. You ever been knocked down in life? I mean, maybe physically, but figuratively. You ever just had your feet knocked out from under you? You know what I'm talking about? Is it too late? Are your tummies getting hungry? I'm finishing up right here. You can, we've all, we all know what it's like. There's trouble in the world and things happen to us, Right? It's great to know that we've got people around us sometimes that can help us up when we experience trouble. There's a Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon, and I don't know that you can uh, read it from there. It's not like there's a lot to read, but uh, Calvin is getting ready, putting on his best clothes to go to school, and first thing that happens to him at school in that first frame is he sits on bubble gum. And then in the third frame there, uh, he has got a bully that beats him up at the locker. The, the fountain backfires in his face. Uh, I'm trying to see what else there is. Uh, anyway, you get to the end, and uh, the, he misses the bus, and on the way home, it pours down rain on him, and you get the idea. It just turns out to be a miserable day. How many of you have had a day like that? Okay, now I got your attention. All right? So the caption there at the bottom, you may not be able to read that, but this is, this is what uh, uh, Calvin says. He says, you know, Hobbes, some days even my lucky rocket ship underpants don't help. It's just the way it is. You want it all to go right, but it just doesn't happen that way. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. See, Jesus is all about helping people up. That's what he does. He's a rescuer. And that's what we're supposed to do for each other. Galatians 6, 2 says, share each other's burdens, and in this way you obey the law of Christ. So there's strength, there's support, and there's spiritual warmth. And this idea of, you know, when it's cold and two can lie down together and keep warm, we don't understand that. I mean, this is talking about the nomads out in the tundra in the desert. You know, when it gets cold, uh, body heat you can put together, you know, that, that doesn't make sense to a lot of us. But the idea of that, that idea should. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 
not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, we're to encourage one another. And there's a spiritual warmth when we share our lives together. One of the most important reasons for us to get together, not only so God can speak to us, but so we can encourage one another. That's what we're here for today, to encourage one another in the Lord. I'm gonna invite the musicians to come, and I've got one last story that I want you to, that I want you to hear as they're doing that. Story says that a pastor went to visit a man who had been absent for church from church for quite some time. And when the pastor arrived at the house, he found this wayward parishioner sitting by himself uh, at, at his fireplace with uh, the fire of glowing coals uh, there in the fireplace. This man fully expected for his pastor to rebuke him for his absence at church. But instead, the pastor just drew up a chair alongside the fireplace where the man was sitting, just looking into the fire. And with the tongs, the pastor reached into the fire and he took one of the red hot coals and he took that coal and he set it on the hearth of the fireplace. And it wasn't long and that red hot coal uh, started to turn black and get cold. And it wasn't long and that ember, that spark there just went out. Didn't say anything to the guy. And the guy just looks over at his pastor and says, I'll be at church on Sunday. Enough said. Together, we're meant to do life together. We're not meant to be alone. And God didn't set us out on our own. He set up this family structure so that we can be who he designed us and created us to be in the first place. And my challenge to you, even this whole message, what we do uh, in our relationships with one another, in our family, in our church, What do we do in our relationship with God? He doesn't want us to be out there by yourself. So I want you to bow your heads with me today and just have a question for you this this morning. If this morning you are that, that coal, you know you are out of the fire and your flame has gone out and you're cold in your spirit and you know you're not in the right place. This morning I want to invite you to say yes to Jesus. What he has, he offers for free. It's just a matter of us taking hold of that and getting in and say, Jesus, I'm in. Make me who you want me to be. This morning, if you need to get right or you want to offer your life to Jesus and take his free gift of salvation and become part of a family, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray with you this morning that that you would find Jesus Christ here today, the greatest thing that could ever happen in your life. Across the room, as I look from my right to the left, if, if that's you, would you just raise your hand? Here in the middle. Thank you. Anyone else? God, I pray for each person in this room. Lord, we were designed by you fashioned by the Creator for specific plans and purposes. And you've set us in families, and you have put us in community with one another, and I pray that we would experience a relationship with you. Lord, I pray for those today that that are saying yes to you as they open their heart, that you would just come in and bring a glow and a warmth as you take uh, the, the sin and the stuff of their life and you clean them, and you set them on a different course, filled with hope and purpose, salvation, joy, peace, what you offer out of a relationship. I pray that everyone here in this room today, that we would open our hearts to you, to hear your voice, to hear your word, to be obedient to what you call us to do, not in our relationship with you as well as our relationship with one another. We need your help today. In Jesus' name, amen.